Okay, good morning. Hello. How's everyone doing right now? Good, good evening last night. We're not hung over, ready to do some intense back end development live this morning. So, uh, hello. Uh, for those of you who are not from Montreal, probably you don't know me, my name is Mathieu Eby. Uh, I've been a member of the Drupal community here for like 10 years. Uh, every year I kind of participate in Drupal Camp. This presentation I did at Drupal Camp Montreal last year and I thought it was pretty popular. Even though I was just winging it, I just, I just fired up the terminal and tried playing around. So this year I decided I'm going to clean it up and try to make it into a real presentation with slides and stuff. So uh, I've been working with Drupal for 10 years. Uh, I started doing web development when I was uh, in high school. And my first job, I was given a bunch of web pages to update. And I said, no, I screwed up. I don't want to do that. And I looked around on the server, and there was a PHP. I said, great. And I got myself a book that says, database-driven applications with PHP. And it said, oh, you can use a database. And then I had to call the guy that ran the database and ask him for permission to connect with super fancy Postgres database. And that was my first experience building database-driven PHP applications. Uh, if you want to reach me, I'll have a slide at the end with uh, more contact information. For now, let's just start with the main subject. Okay, so let's start with this question. Uh, how many of you, when you first fired up Drupal 8, thought, yeah, I know how Drupal works, so if I just look at the database for Drupal 8, I'll know basically how things change from there. Yeah? A bunch of people, right? So how, how much did you understand from doing that? Yeah, like I, I, I gave up after a while, right? Because uh, really Drupal 8 is just not the same paradigm as what I was doing with my Postgres when I started, or even Drupal 7. It's not a database application anymore. It's a, a whole new kind of framework for organizing an application. It's a services and objects application. And what that implies is that we really don't care about the database anymore because it's just one of many possible storage engines. And just a Drupal entity system will use one of two storage engines depending on what kind of entity we're talking about, whether it's fieldable or configurable. So what really does matter in this kind of application are interfaces. Objects are almost synonymous with interfaces. And if we want to understand the Drupal 8 application, we have to look at what kind of interfaces are available to us to manipulate data. So during this presentation, I promise I will not present a single line or a query of SQL. This is band, a band concept. It just confuses us, and it doesn't really help us understand what's going on behind the scenes. We will do all of our thinking using the interfaces that are available to us, and we're going to try to be as solid as we can about it. You, you all know what solid is? Yes, because we all became expert uh, object-oriented developers. OK. So uh, first, a little bit of context. The thing with relational databases is that they're if not dinosaurs, they're more like sharks. They, uh, they were invented sometimes like the 60s or 70s because business data was becoming something like widespread and problematic and everybody was reinventing the wheel. We had uh, software mixed with data and then people said, you know, we can just separate what the tables of data are from the applications and put a nice little query interface in between, that query interface became SQL. And that was great because now there was a DBA that managed all the business data and you had your programmers on the other side. And the programmers just queried things from the database and the database took care of making sure that the data was safe and it wasn't corrupt and you could not bankrupt a multinational corporation for software. And when we started building PHP applications, we thought, well, that's great. We have all 
this open source database software that solves 50% of our application problem. Like we can store data, and we can index it and query it, and we can just focus on building our application. But didn't really work out the way we intended, and the proof of that is just how much trouble we had with SQL injection. Because the structured database, it wasn't really designed for a web application. It was designed for holding business data and managing it and making it powerful and efficient. And that's not our problem here at all. So as the domain of web applications evolved, uh, we ended up having to teach junior developers over and over again, no, you, you cannot just concatenate a string and send it to the database. You have to run it through all these filters, otherwise you might bankrupt a multinational corporation. And that's, that's the problem as you always meant to solve in the first place. So clearly we were going in the wrong direction. So the smart people, and I'm talking like uh, Mark and Fowler and Uncle Bob and all the agile, uh, object-oriented people, they said, okay, a real enterprise application needs a pattern for managing the data storage. And that kind of went into two different directions, depending on what your philosophy was. On one side, there's the active record pattern, and the other side, there's the data mapper pattern. So I'm not an expert on the subject. Like I, just, I just looked at it because I was curious about what kind of system Drupal had implemented. But the most basic one is active record, which, as I understand it, means you write a class that wraps your table, and then you can just add whatever interfaces you want to. And that's very popular, for example, uh, for exactly the kind of people who like Ruby on Rails because it's a basic framework in Ruby. But there's uh, also many PHP implementations of that stuff. Uh, what's the one in... Um, it's called Eloquent, the one that's in uh, most popular PHP frameworks. And you, know, you have implementations in every other language and frameworks also. And the alternative to that is the data mapper, which says, you know, probably the database is some legacy business system, and we don't want our application contaminated with that stuff. So we're just going to create our ideal objects and then through some other kind of system, we're going to map this ideal object to what the actual storage is. So this is the doctrine ORM. Uh, uh, it's bundled, or uh, actually it's like a kind of a partner of Symfony. It's the most supported system in Symfony. And it lets you just declare what your objects are. And then using annotations, you say, well, you know, we're going to generate a table for this, and it's going to be called product, so it can be called anything. And our columns are going to be these, and they're going to have these constraints, and so on and so forth. So it's a very straightforward way of both building an application and describing the storage group. So these ORM frameworks, you have a flavor of either of them in every language. Uh, but they sort of got a bad reputation after a while because people were saying, oh, this is a leaky abstraction. As soon as I try to do something that's outside of the framework, I have to learn SQL again. And I have to find out how to fit that into the framework. And the problem basically is the frameworkness of it. Like you can't have a one universal system that's going to be able to properly map data to storage in every application. So in, in cases like this, you sort of have to write your own custom-built uh, ORM system. Uh, and that takes us back to Drupal. And if you go back in time, you know, web content used to be so simple. You had, you had your, your page, and the page had a title, and the body, and maybe some tags. And it was very straightforward to just make a table and say, this is the, the body columns, the title column, here you go with your data. Now here's your content. But then somebody thought like, hey, that's great and all, but you know, we can have a hook that can let us create custom fields. And these custom fields can have custom widgets. So, and then someone said, oh, you know, writing hooks is a lot of trouble. So we're going to have 
a nice interface that lets us generate configuration that adds custom fields to stuff. And then someone said, hey, this is great, it can add that to pages, but hey, I, I want to add that to users as well. And then someone said, okay, but what about translations? Like, my language is uh, left to right, uh, bottom to top. Like, how do I manage that? And I want that in 100 languages, and I want to keep revisions of everything. And I'm not even going to mention paragraphs in that, because that makes it insanely more complicated. So what we ended up with is a data domain that is a configurable, structured, translatable, revisionable, typed document. And I don't know what more needs to be said. When I hit node save, it should just work. I don't want to call 15 different methods here. So data mapper, data mapper just isn't going to make it for that kind of problem. We need a way heavier solution. OK. So just to illustrate the kind of domain we're working, in, working with in Drupal, in Drupal 8 at least. Uh, we have the entity, and this entity has like two other dimensions, which are its possible translations and its possible revisions. And within an entity, we have two kinds of fields. There are bundle-generated fields, and there are base fields. Within a field, we have a list of items. We can have zero or more items of that field for any possible field. And within a field item, we have properties. Sometimes that property is just called value, leading to many confusing interface calls. But usually, you'll have things that are uh, more specific, like uh, entity ID for reference or uh, the uh, text filter format. That being said, to navigate through all of these dimensions and hierarchies, we're going to need solid interfaces. And Drupal has a lot of these interfaces. So just to scan down an object, here's what we get to do. First, on the inter entity interface, there's the get type data. Because the actual data of an entity does not exist on the entity object itself. It is bridged. Once we get, get type data, we get the data of the entity itself as a complex data interface, which is kind of like a key array, but an actual object with more stuff in it. Uh, the complex data interface, you can call get properties again, and then you get a whole bunch of field item list interface objects, with the keys being the field names on the entity. We can also uh, wait there. Get get field name the same. Okay. Uh, field item list interface. This one has a zero or more, so you're going with numeric index. And then you get your field items. In the field item interface, you can add the properties again, which gets you the type data interface which are the individual properties like uh, text format or value by their keys. And then finally, once you have your final value object, you can call get value on it to get the raw string or number or whatever it actually holds. So anything in there. And to help us out and confuse us at the same time, each of these interfaces implements a whole bunch of magic methods. So we can pretend that we're using them as arrays or objects, or just set them and get them like we did in Drupal 7. And behind the scenes, that magic happens. It also implements uh, some more fancy PHP iterator stuff. So you can use for each on some of these objects, or you can use array access. So you can call directly zero instead of get zero. So uh, let's go see how that works out in the terminal.
For those who don't know this, it is the the, the Seychelles, which is implemented both in Drush and the Drupal console, which lets you do interactive debugging of your application. So I'm going to create a node, the most elementary type of node, which is a page. Could you zoom in a little? Yeah. Could you zoom in a little? Zoom in? Uh, yeah, I checked this morning. Oh, yes, at the top. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see. can make it a little bigger, I think. Okay, so I have my node entity. Let's explore what's in there. So I'm going to save it for future reference here. Okay. Okay, so uh, there is no actual data on this. The data exists on the bridged object, which is the type data. So to get my fields, I have to use the get fields property. Let's see. This is my first property, and it's equivalent to uh, what did we say about this? Get type data. So it gets me the entity adapter. If I look at this. Uh, Should have all the fields, but there will be called the uh, properties. Here. There you go. Same thing. Okay. So the entity adapter wraps all the data around the entity. So now we have all our fields here. We're going to have a look at uh, the body because it's a classic field. It's called the field item list in this case. Field item list. What's on this? A whole bunch of other interfaces. You can access a pen count, delete, filter, go to the first, and lots of magic magic also. So since we're dealing with interfaces, it's always interesting to look at what kind of classes we are dealing with. So the body is a field item list interface, and its parents are the item list and the type data class. The type data class shows up everywhere in the hierarchy. It's both a container and the final contained item. So it gives you a pretty universal interface to what your entity object is doing. Another interesting thing to look at is the interfaces that are implemented. So here you have a lot more stuff, and it's wrapping because the text is too big. But for instance, the traversable type data interface lets you do for each about. So in this case, there are no keys. Because it's for this. 
I think I will have zero value, so nothing can happen. So let's try an interface. I'm gonna count. So we have no items in our body. Tricky to start using the interface. Can we create directly from here? We have create instance. I think I found an item. But first, uh, so I don't have a bot yet. I just created the node, so I Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how did I create this? I think I can just go with the value. I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Just going to use a magic setup. Or no, this is a complex text. Right? Probably shouldn't have done it. Let's go with a title. It's much more simple. No title. Yeah, that's it. It's a field item list. Okay. And you'll find that uh, this is supposed to give you exactly the same as this. Yeah. So this is an example of the magic methods that are available on this interface. So I have my title. I should be able to do this. All right. Meaning that I've used a magic method to write into the value property of title. <coughs> so if I inspect title more closely, my title is a field item list. I count it, I have one property. If I get the property, that's not what I want. Just call the first one. Okay, now I've, okay. So my title is a string item, field type. And within that field type, <coughs> I look at the class parameters of my title field. It uses the map data type, the type data, and field item base, as well as string item base. This means that I'm not at the end of my hierarchy yet. I can for each this one. Oh, this is what it is. Look at the keys. Right. So the title as a value. Huh? Generate sample value, I forgot about that. Get this. Okay, so within my title field, I also have a string data item. The value is not simply a text property, it's another type data object. So let's go value property. Let's inspect that one. And it has its own interface. So we have to think of this hierarchy as having, I don't know, four or five levels, depending on whether you count iteration. <coughs> and the end is where you actually get your typing. Because the string uh, value that we put into the title does not uh, actually help us with uh, the domain modeling that we need to do. So everything at the end is wrapped around the final, what do we 
call this data type. The data type is the very elementary object in our hierarchy. I'm going to go back to the body. That still exists? Okay. Because I just remembered how to get some stuff into it. All right, that's going to be more interesting. So now I have one value, which means I can do this. Here we go. And this, again, is a magic method. So it should be completely equivalent to this one. True, okay. Actually, is it identical? So it's the same object, it's all by reference. Now, my body is a text with summary item. Let's call this body item. Body item. What kind of interfaces are on it? Constraints and TD iterator. So we can also iterate on this one. So we can call get properties. And that's one of the most interesting methods because it tells you what's available on your field. This one is a value, a format, and a summary. If you pass true, it'll include computed properties. We'll come back to that later. In the end, though, I just want to inspect or modify what's on my class. I will focus your attention on this thing. Uh, tricked by the magic methods here. So the body item, if I call format on it, it will give me a filter format data type. If I just call format, it gives me the value that's wrapped around it. It's a very common mistake and it's confusing for no reason. But the filter format data type has some interesting properties that the string value doesn't have. So if I call format Try to manipulate my filter format object. I can get setable options. I can have my list of options that are available for that field. So this is no longer coupled to the entity form system. It now exists on the object. <coughs> and those are all my possible values. So if I go uh, on my format and try to uh, set it. Call set I have to call set value to something that's nonsense. It will do it, but it's no longer part of my options. And that takes us to our next topic. Validation. Every object in the type data hierarchy, whether it's the entity, the field item list, the field item, the elementary data type item, has the validate method. And this allows us, for one fun part, to decouple the constraints from storage. Uh, MySQL and different storage engines usually offer constraints like not null, and the string needs to be a certain size. But when we have a more complex data model, as we do in Drupal, where we want to manage documents, this is not sufficient. 
we need to apply more advanced constraints. So we have a validation system that allows us to do that, and it also allows us to decouple constraints from forms, which is how it was handled in Drupal 7. If you wanted to, uh, for example, mark something as an email, you had to validate it with an email as part of the form widget. This has all been moved onto the MTD data object, which means our domain model is decoupled both from storage and UI, and UI which has interesting potentials that we'll look at later concerning uh, serialization. Right, back to the demo. So, I gave my body field a nonsensical value, which means I should be able to validate it. And I get an object of type constraint violation list, which doesn't tell me much at this point because it will always return a constraint violation list. But if I look at the count, it says I have one violation. Which is the value selected is not a valid choice, which means my nonsense value was filtered against the options of the field right inside the object. An interesting thing about validation is that it goes back up the tree, which means I can also validate my node. I also get a constraint validation list. Oh, that's not quite right. All right. This. I have my one error. But, all right. You'll notice one difference. Before it says on the object type filter format, my value was not valid. Now it says on an object of type entity adapter within the body, within the first item, within the format, my value is not a valid choice. Meaning we have a tree of validation errors. And this is what the NTD uh, form system uses now to validate that the data, the content you've entered into the site uh, is valid or not. Using this path, it will mark the widgets that you uh, <coughs> entered incorrectly. But the validation no longer needs to exist on the form, although you can still add some rules, but they have to be UI specific. So to know what kind of validation constraints are available, you have them on the objects itself. I think uh, oh yeah, I need to get into the adapter, but if I go back to my I can get all the constraints, here we go. And this is actually called a complex data constraint. Uh, oh, this is a configurable constraint. Oh, oh wait, I, I used the wrong field, sorry. So the title field has a length constraint, out of the body field. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> not have constraints. There are two constraints here. The primitive type constraint, which comes from the text, which means this has to be a text. And the allowed values constraint, which means my choice has to be part of the choices that were configured for that field. Actually, let's try the other constraint, the primitive type. Um, will the format allow me to set a non-string value? Let's try this.
this work? It's not oh, said that. Okay, so now I have a big time object as part of my format, which it says right now. Wonderful. didn't work because it tries to cast a string let's try something that's more numeric uh, now it behaved better I tried to do something too weird with it let's see what it thinks of that well yes I said it's not a valid choice Meaning I violated the first, I violated the second as well, because of course the number is not a valid choice. Okay. So this is the overview of the constraint system. Another interesting subject. Since we have such a complex data hierarchy, is how do we query for stuff? Like, we want to find out, okay, what pages were created by Tim, uh, whose French translation has a second paragraph body with the contents, bonjour. So, who wants to try writing that as an SQL query? <coughs> I certainly do not. It'll rip, I'll rip my hair out if I have to do that. The Drupal has a much better solution. It's called uh, dot notation, which allows you to query into fields. How many of you have used entity query as a system? Are you all pretty familiar with it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to give a quick demo. Another interesting thing about entity queries is that you can also query configuration entities, which means it's backend agnostic. value get value things I I could never get it correctly the first time it's a big design mistake in Drupal 8 in my opinion but you know if you keep trying you'll figure out where you are in the hierarchy so now my node should be valid I still have a validation which is where I hope 
though. That's bad. Still doesn't want to. Anyway, whatever. I'll just trash my node and start over. I should have an invalid title because it cannot be empty. <coughs> the title needs to be my title. Now I have no validation errors, meaning I can finally save my node. Okay, so now I have a node in the storage. So if I hit my storage, Ask for all my nodes to tell me one result. And if I put a condition on that, that my title. No results. If I'm looking for my title, I get one with my results back. An interesting thing about doc notation is I can query across entities. So my node is still here. If I look at its author, no. get the author. You are right. Okay, it's an entity reference field like the So I can just inspect what's in it. Target ID is zero, which means the anonymous author. You can't set it to the admin. Can we do ID equals one. Ah, uh, oh, now I've broken the. Now target ID is one. Let's save this. Still getting my result, but I will add another condition. I can reference that. I'll specify. Who knows what the user name field is on the user object? The name? Ah, let's just do it the uh, old fashioned. UID is not the actual property. We can do something fancy. So one of the interesting things about entity queries is you can also use it to query configurable entities. Which means, if 
I want to find out in the system all the fields that use the text with summary field time field type. <coughs> There you go. Well, this is an instance of using queries to examine what the entities are in my system. Uh, we can come back later to using dot notation, but there's other subjects on the floor. Okay, so more advanced uh, topic now, the data definition. How do we create all of these fancy objects? Well, there's an intermediate system we have to go through which is the data definition object, which is sort of like a builder pattern, but not quite. Which means uh, on every type of field we have, we have to define, we have to set what the field definitions are, and that's a list of data definition interface objects keyed by the name of the property. So for example, uh, in the body field, we have the value, we have the format, and we have another special one called process. And the actual the field object needs to tell the builder system, okay, this is the property of the value, this is the property of the format, and this is another special property called process. So every field class has this. At the end of that are data type plugins. So when we're looking at our text filter, this is the actual object that wraps the filter that gives us our possible values. And it's annotated with an identifier for that data type, the filter format. This is also where we define the constraints for validation. Am I out of time? Yeah. Oh, shit, I thought it was like an hour. Uh, very sorry. I'm just going to very quickly create an object and skip serialization and normalization. So to create objects, you call up the type data manager. Let's just use the same. the identifier of the definition that I want to create. So I need to create instance. <laughs> this is supposed to work. Either create elementary data types or I can create field items that are more complex. And this is the definition, the mat metadata that will allow me to create my field. Once I have this definition, then I can create the actual object. But first, you can inspect that a little bit. <coughs> Okay, this consists only of metadata about what I'm about to build. So if we look at the constraints, for instance, on our body field, uh, there are none, but if I do an integer, get the constraints, then I get the primitive type constraint again. After that, when I want to create the actual data object, I have to use this data definition object. And again, using the type data manager, I uh, just want to see. 
see what the prop interface is first. It's a create here that takes the data definition object. Yeah, this one here. And then pass it the value. Yeah, create. That's my def. I should be able to create an empty body field. Here we go. The text with summary ID. Uh, this is the kind of magic that allows other systems instead of database storage to work. I'm going to very quickly go to serialization. Serializer. Right? Which means I can do something like this. Let's start with this, yes. just get its normalized representation. With the node, with this data, I could manipulate this data or read it from a API. But the magic happens when I try to turn it back into my object. And then, for the express version of serialization, but I had more time last year. Uh, we're not going to do fancy stuff. Uh, this is over. Thank you for coming. You've been great. I hope I helped you out in your group of class. We still have time to go to the bathroom. <laughs>